My name is Mary Shaw and I live in Philadelphia. What I do is I look at art, collect art, enjoy art, enjoy art people, and I write books. That's what I do now. Well, you know, I started collecting when I was really very young. Um, I collected images of things and things just because I did. Uh, and I had a very favorite art uncle who was an artist. And so I got, and he painted mainly, and I got into really flat painting kind of things, but not paintings. And when I was in college, I think I made what you call my first acquisitions. And they were two Toulouse Lautrec posters. They weren't the real posters, they were lithographs of the posters. But in those days, that was the 60s, and I, you know, 60s America, everybody, not everybody, but many of us thought, ah, Paris and Toulouse Lautrec at that time. So it was very meaningful to me. And so I had these, two, and the graphics were great. So, you know, fantasy and beauty, and so there they hung on my college walls. So that's when I really, I would say that kind of marks, in a way, my collecting art. When I married Peter Shaw, who I continue to be married to, and uh, he also came from a place where he loved art and had been around art. Peter was and is a very aspiring ambitious kind of guy and he wanted to collect um, art that was just like expensive. I mean whatever expensive means to anybody and I it was the first big fight we ever had because I was you know even though at that point I was already a lawyer in a big fancy law firm I felt like I still had these vestiges of being a hippie and I thought art belongs to the People, people don't possess this, this is expensive. It really, literally was the first big fight we had. And um, so we came to this impasse and um, Peter, talented guy that he is, took another tack and he, we went to the museum, next time we went to the museum and he said, we're, we lived in Philadelphia and so we went to the Philadelphia Museum of Art which has the greatest Duchamps in the world and he said, Look at the label there, and of course it says the Ehrensburg Collection. And then we looked at other work, you know, all my favorite works, and he'd say, look at the label there, the John J. Johnson Collection. Everything was obviously, and everything, but most things were gifts from collectors. And so I became persuaded, and we bought the artwork that he wanted us to buy. It was. Uh, it is a Dorothea Rockburn, which is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful painting. And it still lives, hangs in our living room, but our ha living room is a different living room, but it's still there. And um, however, it is also promised to a museum. Well, uh, this is what we do. In the beginning, it was all, Peter was, let's buy this, let's buy this, let's buy this, let's buy this, and my saying, no, 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 no. But now, um, the way we acquire is we, we look at lots and lots and lots of work. We only buy work that we agree on. Uh, and um, we try to be open to other people's ideas. Um, but we only buy work that we agree on. We only buy work that we can exhibit in our homes. It's not all exhibited all the time, or it's given it to a museum, but we do not buy any work that will not be shown. We don't think that's a good thing to do. We don't believe in lots of storage. I know a lot of people do it, and that's great, but the art should be seen. And we have a lot of people to our home, and they see it, so that's 
So that's what we do. So we don't acquire things that we can't. Um, and we only acquire living artists. There's only one exception to that. We bought a work from a, uh, a widow, but because it's the living artists who benefit from our buying work. And we think that um, all collecting is really contemporary, and that's the kind of collecting that enables artists to survive, make work, and have their work preserved. So that's our roundabout our acquisition policy, I guess you'd call it. Look, 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 look. Um, and I, I'm a reader, and I'm an investigator. As I mentioned, I'm a lawyer, uh, and um, so, but I, I think, you know, we both, we both read a lot. I guess I probably read a little more, um, but mainly we look, and we talk to people. You can learn an enormous amount from other people, um, curators, other collectors, gallerists. You know, people, people think gallerists are, or they have a bad rap, which is that they are sellers in the unattractive sense of the word, but. Um, most of the good dealers became gallerists, they would call themselves, but dealers is not a dirty word because they love art, you know, and they know a lot and they see a lot. And um, so we do a lot of talking. Hopefully we do a lot of listening, I should say. <laughs> Reading and looking. The price is right now. Um, everybody's constantly talking about the bubble, they're high, the market is only for the very finest quality of certain kinds of work and only five artists are, are selling. And then there are these young artists who are flash in the pans who are selling for extraordinary prices. That's sort of the, um, sort of the the talk. Um, but you know, that's been the talk for a long time since I've been collecting, you know, so I don't know. I think that I think you do not buy anything that's a fad. I think we, we, my policy, my husband stretches it a little, but my policy is never to buy an artwork. Um, for a price that if I lost all the money, it would matter. That's the way I look at it. Everybody everybody will say to you, only buy what you love, don't buy for investment, don't, you know. And that's all true, And but you can't help when you spend a lot of money on an artwork feeling, should I do this, should I not do this? So I just, I just try not to, but as I said, my husband extends it farther than I would, but I try not to allow him to, or talk him up, buying anything where, you know, it, it would make a difference if it was worth nothing tomorrow. And I don't buy uh, secondary market work. Uh, I just don't buy it. I only buy original work, you know, and so when you do that, Maybe you're overpaying, but you're not, you know, you're not overpaying that much. I mean, and who, who knows what overpaying is? I mean, it's very famously all sorts of great artists, including Robert Ryman, whom I love and whose work we own, says, I would never pay that much for my paintings. You know, who knows what it's, who knows what the value is? But I think you don't overpay if you don't pay more money than you're prepared to lose. And, you know, and you buy it for forever and sometimes you don't have it for forever but I just think that um, don't buy trends I think that the art market is the least regulated market we have right now it's the only place that operates on insider trading and it's fine you sit on if you sit on museum boards, if you're a lucky person like I am who knows a lot of people in the world, you know what artists are getting 
going to have exhibits in the future. Everybody says, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but MoMA's going to have a show in three years. You know, who the curators are looking at, you know, you know so it is based almost entirely on insider information. And that's unfortunate, you know, but it's true. It's completely unregulated as far as I'm concerned. Um, now, there's not enough regulation, a lot of people think, for any of the financial markets either, and I'm sure that's true, but um, at least some people somewhere think there should be rules. In the art market, it's, nobody even thinks about that. They think it's just fine. You know, um, I think the art market would survive no matter what happens. I think art is vitally important to people in this world. I think the visual, I think the feeling, I think it's a major, it archives our world. It gives us our history. That's what we look at. And I include in the art market books, though some people not. I mean, that's how we know our history. Um, and there's a need for that. There's a human need that's very important. And I don't care what you did, there'd always be an art market, even if you regulated it. It wouldn't be, you know, the elite people wouldn't like it as much. And in some ways, it wouldn't be as much fun, and, you know, but. It's so, in, it's so, uh, I don't know even how you could regulate it, but nothing, nothing would eliminate, when you call it the art market, the, the trading of art, the buying of art, the selling of art, the just, I don't think it would happen. We have, um, I kind of have a fund of money that's a trust. Um, that supports um, active programs. You know, somebody needs a catalog made of an artist that otherwise wouldn't have a catalog through an institution we pay for it, or we sponsor exhibitions, or we do that kind of thing. Uh, we do not acquire work for a foundation. We don't have any desire to have a museum of our own or anything of that sort. We think that there's these great museums that are doing a great job and we support them and give them money. I'd like to support the living, the happening, not just like things. I mean, my name's on some buildings or rooms somewhere, but that's not my main, my main. Thing. I, uh, you know, I mean, when I was chairman of the Wilma, obviously I needed to do that. We built a new theater, I needed to, you know. But now it's really the stuff that nobody else wants to support, the transitory. You know? You're building something, people want their name on the building. But I think it's really important to support the living, the now. Um, make sure that the voice that speaks a little differently is preserved and heard. Um, and so, and I, I just, that's kind of the way I feel about it. First book I wrote, I, you know, I wrote as a lawyer, um, but I never wrote except for articles, um, a book about art. And the first book I wrote was about an artist who was very important to me. He was, he lived in Philadelphia. He knew, he was very uh, successful when he was a young man. He lived in New York then. He got very uncomfortable in New York because the galleries wanted him to sell this because it was so successful and he wanted to do that and he didn't like the system. And I met him when he was 71 years old because I had bought his work, Peter and I had bought his work. and. Uh, I don't know, he was 71 and he just decided it was time to talk to somebody about everything. And he, he chose me. That was it. I wasn't going to write another book. And then I happened to be in yoga classes with Caroline Schneider. She read my book and she said, you've got to publish another book, you've got to write another book. I want to publish this book. 
it turns out she was the she's the publisher Sternberg Press, which is a great press. So I'm doing a series of books for Caroline, uh, for Sternberg Press, that is. And they're, the series is called The Noble Art of Collecting. And each book is almost like a periodical. Each book is 100 pages. So the first one is called The Word, the Book, and the Spaces They Inhabit. And it features such artists as Paul Chan, who uses lots of words in his art, Carl Andre, uh, Joseph Kasuth, Rosa Baba, William Shakespeare. So that's what the book is about. The next one's on Matisse and jazz. So um, Andre Sala will be in it, and we'll see. I would say that, um, you know, I actually, lots of young collectors sort of talk to me and sort of become friends with me. And I would say you should look. I think it's a good idea to, to belong to collectors groups and institutions just to kind of get your feet wet. I would say travel. Travel a lot. Go different places. Go to your own places, of course, in your neighborhood. But go all over the world. Come to Basel if you can, you know. But if you don't have the money to do, don't come to Basel, but go someplace. Go someplace else. Look, look, you know, at the city, the nature. But look at the art, too. And listen to the music. Um, and uh, I would say get out there in the world. You have to contemplate, too. If you want to collect, you have to go, you know, and you have to see, and you have to interact. But I think that collectors groups are a really, really good thing to start with. And I also think that um, collectors who are older, they welcome the opportunity to talk with younger people, you know. They'll help you along. And also, the galleries. Just go to the gallery. Go and look. Don't go, you know, in the middle of the biggest whatever. Just go in and look. And people will spend time with you, you know? I mean, I don't mean to be a Pollyanna. I mean, I remember when we started collecting and we'd go to New York galleries and some of them wouldn't give us the time of day and they wouldn't even sell us work because they were, you know, you know, they were looking for the right placements and everything, you know? And um, that was until the recession. <laughs> but, but, you know, but, but really just go talk to the gallerists, you know? They will... They will help you. Uh, they're really big assets. But there's nothing like belonging to some group, you know, just of people who are sort of wanting to do the same thing you're wanting to do. Actually, the first time I went to Brazil um, was I went on business, believe it or not, because I had a client, uh, a big corporation, who had an executive who was involved in a lawsuit or did things that were involved in a lawsuit, and I had to interview him. And he was a Mormon, so every seven years, the Mormons have to go on missions. And he was in the jungles of Brazil, supervising about 200 young people between the ages of 18 and 21 who are out proselytizing. And this was in the 80s, and it was a really rough time in Brazil. And then, of course, when I came back, I mean, I, I went to Rio, too. I started really looking at Brazilian art. And then I'm very close friends with the Dela Cruzes, who are here in Basel. I don't know if you've seen them, but they're here in Basel this year, as always. And, um, and they are big collectors of South American art. They're from Cuba. And they, when we decided we were going to go back to the Sao Paulo Biennale, they said, Mark Antonio. And, we got in touch with Mark Antonio, and he had flowers in my hotel room, and he took us everywhere around Brazil. And I think we bought something like 11 or 12 pieces of art, because um, which we don't do. Oh, I shouldn't say we don't do, we did. But it's not like us, but it was so teeming, and it was so beautiful, and we could see it through him. He told us, you must meet Luisa Strina. We met Luisa Strina. She had an unbelievable Silda Morales hanging over her 
fireplace. That's what Mark Antonio did for us. Wonderful Mark Antonio. We all miss him greatly.